There was a story I ran yesterday about the Apollo photographs, and more and more people are getting onto this. Uh, it, oh, yeah. it was so, and you, you were really one of the very first people to do this. And, and when I say to all of you listening, do this, Jay brought the story forward that it was a Stanley Kubrick production. There was too much riding on this whole thing, the Van Allen radiation belts and all the rest of it. Uh, it was all shot on the back lot on an enormous soundstage. Uh, somewhere, perhaps and they had built one in Palmdale or Lancaster, I heard. I don't know where it was, but this was all staged, and that's why the video was so crappy in many cases, especially when the uh, the lunar module lifted off. Uh, it just looked like third-rate video, and, and they did that on purpose, to, to obscure the fact that it was a model. Uh, oh, yeah, there's a, um, uh, uh, you actually posted an article um, by a Ukrainian physicist, Oleg Olenek. Yes. And yes. Uh, he did a 3D parallax viewing of the Apollo Beautiful photographs. Beautiful story. Wonderful story. That's, that is the, the lock. That is the irrefutable That's science. That's hard science. It's, it's in the casket. It's buried. It's the, I mean, whatever cliches you want to come up with, you know, the smoking gun. But anyway, folks, what he did, and, and, and just look, type in Oleg Olenek, and Jeff has the article up at his archives, and uh, is that uh, he he took two photographs that were slightly apart from each other and then combined them. And what you do is you create parallax so you can look at the backgrounds. And when you jiggle the two separated photographs, say separated by a, a meter or so, uh -huh. the background should not move because it's far away, right? Do you understand what I mean? The of background course. will not move. Depth the foreground field. will. If the background moves, that means it's a lot closer to the yeah. foreground than we think. And that's exactly what happened. And Oleg, Dr. Olenik, concluded that the astronauts were standing in front of a screen that was about 30 meters behind them. Exactly what I've been saying. It slipped oh, by, I think. Yeah, and I think I'll, it's an important story. It's a very one. I'm going to put it back up. There's so many stories that are... Uh, important that I, I just wish what's I interesting about this whole Stanley Kubrick thing is one his daughter is finally coming out um, and, and she was estranged she from Stanley uh, she's actually coming out to be quite a conspiracy theorist um, which is interesting uh, like like daughter like father I guess huh. and um, another thing is the hottest screenplay in Hollywood right now is what called 1969 a space odyssey which is uh, about the travails of Stanley going through faking the moon landings. Uh, and so this thing is now, I think, gone beyond, you know, uh, if, if we can prove, and I think we can now, uh, and I will in, in Kubrick's Odyssey 3, my new film, if we can prove that this is all fake, then they've been faking this stuff since at least, the, you know, the late 60s. And, and so this kind of just changes everything about all of reality since then. How many things have been faked since then? You're looking at Sandy Hook or looking at the Boston bombings, which are recent events. Right. But maybe we ought to start going back and looking at a whole lot of other things. Uh, no arguments here. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're really looking at something now. Uh, I guess you could say this, no pun intended, the sky's the limit. Uh, they <laughs> really can do any. Look what they've done on Mars. Look how many yeah. years they told us that the Martian sky was this ugly, reddish-brown. It's, it's, it's as blue as a blue sky over Florida. It is. I mean, it has clouds. Absolutely. <laughs> and the, apparently around the equator, it's uh, 75, 80, 80 degrees in the summer, and yep. there's life on Mars, and then it just goes on and on. Uh, oh, but, yeah, it is. The biggest uh, bunch of... Uh, uh, we have had the wolves pulled so clearly over us that yeah. uh, we we don't even know what's going on. That's what I think you and I and the people that are listening, what we're doing is we're, we're like the blind man walking in the place where the furniture's been rearranged, trying to figure out what's going on around here. You know what's really funny? Uh, as good as, as Kubrick is, uh, I, I don't think he made a mistake. I think he left telltale signs in the video, in the photos, intentionally. He did. And he did. The, the number one is the, uh, the, when the lunar lander, the LEM, hit, hit the soil and, and put down, there's no blast hole under it. No. None of that lunar dust even moved. It no, was, because... It was put there by a crane. <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, there's actually um, photographs of the lunar rover 
um, sitting on the ground next to the um, to the loon, to the uh, module, uh, obviously taken like through the window, and there's no tracks. I mean, behind the the lunar rover, oh, it, it just what it just like it just got plopped there That's without funny. any. Uh, and this happens quite a bit. Yeah. And um, there's a, a very funny thing. Uh, one of the things that Stanley liked to do. Uh, in those days, we didn't have video, was he would take uh, Polaroid photographs of the scenes to see if the lighting was correct. And so Stanley would run around the sets every day, you know, making 2001 or Clock or Corns or whatever, and shooting all these Polaroids. And then he'd be looking at them and rearranging the lights. Well, there's this hilarious shot in the Apollo archives of, of you know, the lunar lander sitting there. And there on the leg of the flat leg of the lunar lander are two... Polaroid photographs. Oh, you're and kidding. they're not curled up as they should be in a 250 degree heat. This they're laying a, flat. This is a formal NASA photograph, supposedly. Yep, you can you can find it in the archives. It's just sitting there with two Polaroid photographs. If, you, if on, you find it, send it. Will you? I'll put it up. I as will. A splash. I will. This, that's, I'll put it up at the top of the. It, I mean, it's hilarious, man. Polaroid photographs would curl in <laughs> seconds on the moon. Too funny. It, it, it is. It, what's funny is that we still believe that human beings could walk around in that environment um, unprotected. And furthermore, if they did walk around in that environment unprotected, or protected with only those suits, then maybe we ought to lend those suits or facsimiles of those suits to the people in Fukushima. Yeah. You know? Well, they're, they're useless. Of course they are. Too funny. Well, I'd love to see that picture. I'll put it up. Uh, I will get yeah, it. It's, for you. it's time. It's time. You know, we, we're ready. We're ready. Let's think. Come yep. on, just lay it out there. Stand well, the millennials don't believe it at all. By the way, they're down their thirties, they don't. I don't. I haven't met one yet that believes it. <laughs> Interesting. Funny. Stanley Kubrick, the man who created two thousand one. You kind of wonder if he made a deal. How the deal was made. Uh, the mechanics of it, when he was brought into it. Uh, interesting. Any background on that, Jay? Yeah, he was brought into it um, after Dr. Strangelove. They uh -huh. had visited, he, he, he'd sent, sent the Pentagon the script because he wanted to film the, the B-52s, yeah. and uh, they read the script and said no. And so he got uh, uh, pictures from Aviation Weekly, and with his uh, set designer, they rebuilt the interior and the exterior of B-52s using photographs. Huh. The Air Force in, uh, I think it was July of 63, maybe er, or maybe earlier than that, they got word of this, and they sent two people to uh, England where he was filming mm -hmm. uh, to look at what he was doing, and he actually told people on the set that he may get arrested here. He wasn't sure what would happen. Mm -hmm. And they came on the set, and they were like completely blown away by the details. <laughs> And then when they saw the film in late 63, early 64, mm -hmm. I think that they, and, and if you've ever seen the film, especially on the big screen, the scenes where the jet is flying over uh, Siberia, yeah. uh, which are done with front screen projection, yeah. are, for that time, they were jaw-dropping. I mean, yeah. it was oh, yeah. like, it even had smoke coming out of the motor, of the engines and everything. Yep. And, uh, uh, and they saw that, and they went, what? And... Um, <laughs> And I think they knew by then that they it's couldn't actually get to the moon. Yeah, yeah. because Gus Grissom had, had had placed the the lemon on the Apollo capsule, and then a month and a half later he died. Yeah. And he was telling his family that there was no way. This is sixty seven. That there was no way that they were going to get to uh, build. Has the a family thing. has the family substantiated that? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Gus Grissom's wife and his yeah. children both said that he was disgusted and thinking of quitting. And so there's no way that this was being run by a bunch of idiots. And there was another guy who actually, I forget his name now, he was the chief investigator of that incident where Gus Grissom and the other two astronauts died in Apollo mm -hmm. 1. And um, he, uh, he uh, testified in front of the Congress saying that uh, NASA and the Apollo program was completely, uh, completely, uh, could not do what they said they were doing. Mm -hmm. of course. Uh, yeah, it was a farce. And then he died a few weeks later. Oh, him too. Uh, his plane got, uh, tra his car got hit by a train. Jeez, uh, they kill people all the time. Yeah, yeah, and there's no doubt in my mind that he was killed. I mean, uh, they killed and there's a lot more the bodies. Yeah. And they did kill Gus Grissom and, and, the, yeah. and the rest of them. And, you know, 
the, 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 this is, you know, the terror. All you have to really do is YouTube in the press conference for the Apollo 11 astronauts. And oh, look my at their God. Faces. They look like they've all been just sentenced to death. Yeah, they look like de- their dog just died. Something. And, you know, yeah, oh, something. They, they, yeah, no, this, this is all over their faces. I couldn't agree more. It's obvious. Exactly. Obvious. This is the defining moment of their careers, of their life, of history itself. Biggest ho- the world is watching them lie through their teeth, carrying on yep. a hoax that is so outrageous that they're they're beyond human. They couldn't cover it up. They no, were just too you, human. You, exactly. You can see on Neil Armstrong particularly, oh, he, has a, he yeah. doesn't want to lie. This guy just doesn't want to lie. No. He's looking down. He just doesn't want to say anything. This is why he didn't give any interviews for the rest of his life. Look at that. Please do look at that, folks. YouTube video of the first Apollo uh, crew to come back at a press conference. It is, it's really embarrassing. I mean, it's just embarrassing. It would, the lie was so big that they couldn't, they really couldn't fake it that well. It was too much for them. And I can't blame them. Then, you know, you know what else? So many of the Apollo astronauts who allegedly went to the moon and all that kept really, when you think about it, low profiles. They, Absolutely. They, they just didn't talk much. And they, they, to, to this day, they don't talk much. No, uh, I forget his name. I was Savell, Bert, I think it was Bert Savell. He actually got to Neil Armstrong's ranch in Ohio and knocked on the door. Neil Armstrong opened up the door and said, what do you want? And he said, did you really go to the moon? And Neil just walked over to the phone and called the police. I mean, it wasn't even, you know, there's no, No. you know, he's not going to say anything, but none of them are.